Yeah, one market. There's one, two, old English Mickey's, three, if we're counting the Corona, <laughs> four, five, old English, six Miller, seven, Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Is there any on this side? Twelve. And then that's twelve alcohols. That's even one. I'll count that as another one. So that's thirteen. And then cigarettes is one. Three. That could be four. Oh, and there's one more, but that's like 14. 14 bud and four. And 14 alcohols. And four cigarettes. Sad, bro. Just stop. I don't think I'm gonna say anything. I'm just gonna let it go.
That's a really... It's... My reason is... Because if I honestly, if, I, if that thing didn't happen... I'm not saying I like it here, because it caught me here, where I changed my life. So I guess, like, everything started there, so... If it didn't happen, I don't think I'll be a better person like I am today. I'm not saying chill is good, but it's a good experience for me. Back to our agenda, uh, old business summer swim program. It was a success. Thank you for everyone that worked this summer. You guys did a good job. Thank I think our kids can agree with you. that too. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you, Patrick. Thank oh you my Patrick. gosh, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> One of the conditions of the settlement was that the tobacco industry had to make public all of their documents. And what did we find? In their documents, very clearly, it showed the importance of advertising for getting the next generation of users. There are quotes that are there that you can Google. There was, at one point, one of the tobacco industry executives was asked, well, what age do we want to target? Who, who are these kids that we want to bring on board? And his answer was, they've got lips, we want them. The advertisements on the stores, it's within eyeshot of schools. The kid's in the school campus behind the fence and looks outside and there's a store with alcohol advertising in it. Just kind of contradicts any kind of healthy message that we're trying to give to the kids. There's a beach party here, and then you have uh, guys wearing surf shorts and girls wearing like bikinis and bathing suits and stuff. And of course, oh wow, that looks fun. I want to do that, you know? Researchers for the big tobacco companies admitted it is important, if not imperative, that we addict young people because they're our future. That's our whole market share. Tell them they have to stand by. We have three. Go on, Intake. 
Okay. Ten thirteen, ten fourteen. All units be advised. Galley's ready for seventy three. Okay, so basically we have uh, Guam Police Department, JAS, uh, Juvenile Investigation Section, actually coming in with three new admissions that we have uh, presently. Okay, and then we also have one admission on standby from the marshals, which is uh, uh, drug and alcohol related. One of the third kids that we're going to process that's in for alcohol related charges is actually only 15 years of age. And with that, he has, um, he will be charged for beyond control as well as his consumption of alcohol under age and some other um, charges, disorderly conduct, public drunkenness, resisting arrest, assault on a peace officer. So um, as we work in the juvenile facility, when, when we do get a lot of these admissions, that these juveniles that come in, majority of the of their charges are normally um, alcohol related. My nine-year-old sees this this poster and he asks me, "Oh, um, what is that? You know, it has the name of that cigarette, right? Or the name of that uh, of that alcohol." There is that influence in those banner advertising. If you can imagine why those banners are made. A lot of time it's to put that subliminal message in the people's minds. And whether you're three years old or 80 years old, that's what it's meant for. But it's how do we enforce and put teeth to the regulations that are already existing today. That's really where the cognitive thinking starts to kick in and say, oh, I prefer this brand over that brand. It's an issue. It's an issue that we're, you know, trying to get the attention of children. The message is getting across. And it's all gauged towards attracting the young people. here was kind of crazy. First of all, it's my first time in jail, and I'm serving two and a half years. And the whole, how I got in here was, you know, I never really knew how jail was. I never tried being behind bars until there was that one night where, you know, I, I was with my boys and shoot pie, you know, let's drink and, you know, so I decided to turn up and, you know, and started getting more intense where I ended up taking a truck with my boys and, you know, after that we didn't have no beer, so we went to, we started, or we went to the gas station and we started, you know, hitting it up, jacking it, and then after that, you know, we went around the island and it was kind of crazy because I was the driver too and I was so drunk and wasted to the point where there was this guy on a ninja bike, I whacked him on the side, I swipe swept him with the truck and, you know, I, I really regret doing that because I wasn't even thinking straight. I wasn't myself. And you know, that's, that's the reason why I came in there is because I, I was drinking alcohol. I didn't really know how Joe felt. I didn't really care to die. I, you know, I, I was ready for anything. And 
so we want to use um, a similar approach in collecting data to affect policy change because ultimately one of the things that we want to do is limit alcohol advertisements at um, storefronts, um, public places. You know when you go to like a baby luau or like you know the the first the baby's first birthday and you see like Budweiser, or Happy Birthday Tasha, you know s stuff like that. We we want to be able to to limit that um, because we do see the effects of exposure, right? That exposure to alcohol advertisements increases the likelihood for use. Um, youth Youth Organization is primarily a drug, alcohol, and tobacco free organization, so they, they promote those messages. And they do so in a very unique way in that we empower youth on Guam to, to not only listen to those messages, but to promote them themselves. And it ends with this, this level of connectedness with their peers. It's going to be as if they went onto Twitter and they did, they did it, right? So it's just, do you think alcohol advertising um, is a major problem on Guam? Yes or no? And then the, um, the data collection team will just put yes or they'll put no. Um, if we cannot find, if we cannot find um, so we know that there's an issue, but only a few of us really know that's an issue because we're in the industry. We know the field, but the rest of the community doesn't. So the poll is more of like, uh, like you always use this word, it's the temperature check for the community, whether or not it's even an issue for them. It's a good foundation for us to move forward with the policy advocacy. It's not just because, oh, Guam Behavioral Health or Department of Youth Affairs thinks that's an issue. It's the community thinks it's an issue, so our policymakers need to listen to what they have to say. Working with the youth and really activating the youth to be the, in the forefront of doing that poll is to show that they're really the stakeholders, the biggest stakeholders in this policy or in this issue. That's why we need to be involved. It's not the adults working for the youth, it's the youth working towards something that's for their generation. And then um, data collection will be 9-11, and then after data collection, we can do a quick debrief. Um, and we can Can you go, can you join Jonah and Zach? Hello. Hey. 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 Hello. Do you want to go through the shoes? They're going to get another shoe right here. Oh, so there's 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 coming. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, okay. okay. You want me to start getting people in their seats? Oh, yeah. Can I just put some low battery? No. I downloaded the app to some low battery. Youth for you. Are you guys gonna be doing collections too? Did you get the app? Yes. safe and drug-free school zones, we know it's not being enforced. I mean, you have literally stores right next door to schools. That's, that's with, not even within that thousand feet range. And so that's something that's not being enforced. That's actually all not that bad. There's only three alcohol banners. No, two. So there's one, two. But see, the only problem is that just right across the street is a, is a middle school. You know how 
you go fishing, right? When you want to go fishing, you drop the bait close to the fish. If it wasn't so effective, these companies that work for profit wouldn't invest so much money into advertising. So we know it works. Having them very close to schools where young children are is in a way it's really fishing for the next generation of consumers. If children are not given that opportunity to start um, in their formative years, so middle school, high school, and even into college, that they typically don't become addicted to nicotine. They don't become addicted to tobacco-related products. We know that when you start young, the challenge to quit gets harder. Kids, they live for the moment. They live for the same day. In a way, it's kind of marketing to the, to the youth because they're so close to, in, in their eye view, that they can see them. Um, the youth know that they're not supposed to do it, so it's kind of a, 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 a taboo secret, you know, that, hey, I want to try it anyway, and then uh, once they try it, then they, they, they can become addicted. If it's exposure to young children, that's where I see that could be a, a major concern. In the line of work I'm in, I don't feel that the overabundance and prevalence of these banners have no effect on our youth. They do. They have very much a huge effect. For kids that come in here, we already know that when they drink, it's illegal because the legal age for drinking is 21. So when kids are coming here, these are kids under the age of 21. So that in itself is a crime. So when you see things like that, it makes you think like maybe kids think about those things because, you know, they're in plain sight. We did a research project a few years ago with our youth um, researchers at the UOG Cancer Research Center where we were looking at tobacco advertising at point of sale. And what we found was that, number one, you don't even have to go inside the stores to get exposed to the advertising. There was advertising, large visible advertising outside of the stores. And number two, when you went into the stores, where was the advertising? It was at the eye level of children. Half of the ads were within one foot of products that would entice children, like candy. So, so the children are exposed. And so whether or not you intend them to be, they are the audience, they are the target. Right now have, sir, we have like 33 total use right now. Uh, we maxed this place out to 90 some. The youngest we've ever had in here is seven. Seven? Yes, but it was a uh, transition and we didn't put them in. Uh -huh. We try to get, you know, try to avoid getting any kid younger than nine mm -hmm. incarcerated and we'll try to get them out as soon as possible. But if it's a severe crime uh, for that age, it's very hard. We do have um, a predominance of, of crimes that are committed um, in the areas of assault, um, theft, burglary. Um, and I, I, unfortunately, we're seeing also a rise in criminal sexual conduct. And it's interesting that a lot of these crimes as they relate to alcohol are um, preceded by the use of alcohol. I'd, I'd say for, I'd say at 80 to 90 percent are tied to um, substance abuse. Okay, we're going to be escorted by Ms. Santos. Now please be aware we're going into a secure facility, so visual and everything. Okay, we are going to be going to the Foxtrot area. We have how many clients inside there? 19. 19 clients, BOIs. These are juvenile delinquents, juvenile offenders. Their ages vary, so we might have 12-year-olds with 17-year-olds in this facility. Be advised, female indoor. This 
This is our control room here. We also have a medical isolation room on this side. We actually have somebody in isolation right here. Yes. Okay. Downrange. A little bit. You notice our rooms now. There's no more bunks like what you saw at Delta. It's concrete. Their lighting is three glass blocks. If you can take care, you can see the room, how it is. Yes, it, they're, they're, they will be provided a mattress when they do come in and blankets. This is the renovation. If you notice the difference between the, the cells now, we do have it where they cannot reach out. Only part is this part here. They cannot be lifting up their bunks, slamming it. It's all a deterrence now. They cannot be yelling out to what we have. It's like I said, this facility is dated. So a lot of times before they would grab this and start shaking it really hard to make it loud, banging. We try to talk to the kids, mediate, okay? Because we're, the, we're here 24 seven, so we're basically like their parents. So we're the ones here mentoring them, trying to make them, try not to come back in here. You're locked in the room, we control your movements. When you need to drink water, you need to use the restroom, you have to wait for us. I used to work this unit by myself for seven years. When I have 47 kids in there, it's gonna take a while before I send one kid into the restroom, okay? So by the time I get to you, you probably use the restroom on yourself. And I'm sorry to say, this is prison life. If you've never been in jail, you don't wanna try jail because there's a place you don't wanna be, you don't got no freedom. You cannot, you cannot do what you want to do. You cannot, you cannot eat what you want to eat. You cannot use the restroom when you want to use the restroom. You cannot do nothing. Everything you do in jail is what you're told to do, what you're direct to do. And that's something you don't want to live by. You want to live by what you want. You, you want to live by what you want to do. But in jail, it's not a place you want to be. And plus, if it's your first time in jail, it's always a power check. Everybody's gonna power check you. Everybody wants to jam with you and this is all up to you what you wanna do. If you wanna step or you just wanna keep, wanna start, keep getting bullied, it's up to you how you wanna live your life in jail, but this place ain't meant for nobody, so I can see. Honestly, like just looking like at the stores, I mean, it makes us look like all we do is smoke and drink. Like that's just the truth. Like I mean, you look, you like walk, you, like walk up to a store, you drive into like a store parking lot, and you're just like, you look straight at the thing, and the first thing you see is like Marlboro or um, Bud Light or all that stuff, and you're like, what, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> if someone like. Like, Kai would come to Guam and be like, okay, let's go look around the island, and then they see, like, like all these signs, like, like the yeah, the like, it's, like, all clustered, it's so ghetto, and it just makes it look dirty, and... For me, that only sends the message that, that we all drink here on Guam, like, that, or that, that we condone drinking, doesn't matter where or when, and for me, personally, I, I wouldn't, I would want Guam to have a more positive image, for me, that's a negative image for Guam because it perpetuates the idea that, oh yeah, Pacific Islanders drink a lot but in, and smoke a lot, but it also reinforces it 
in ourselves and it affects our psyche because then we start to believe it too. You know what? What you don't see at other stores like at Target or Walmart or even Payless locally, you don't see giant signs promoting what's inside. You already know what's inside. If it's a store, you already know what they sell in there. They sell Diego, they sell sandwiches, they sell drinks, they sell their king cars, and you're pretty sure they're gonna sell alcohol and tobacco. From a marketing perspective, there's too much going on. It's really difficult to kind of parse through all of those messages. That, and so a lot of times I just don't feel it's so effective because it's just it's too many things to look at. It's at a party. Everywhere, you know, on our, our island, you'll see it. Uh, that's, a, that's a big challenge for us. It is. It is. Instead of losing your advertising space, why don't you give it to, like, a local farmer? Why don't you give it to, you know, your grandma who makes, like, the best banana bread? You know, like, those things. Little changes that doesn't take away from your store or, like, the reason why people go there. If you go to the Philippines or Thailand or even Japan, even China, the biggest tobacco manufacturer in the world. When you go into the store, you don't see come into the market and find huge six-foot banners all over the place about the sale of tobacco. I have two boys, too. We're just used to it, you know? Like, I really, I never really thought about it until I was actually designing this. And I was like, what is he talking about, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. We're so desensitized as a community mm -hmm. that we just, you don't realize that it's around you until you look at a place that you frequent and you realize that it's not there and you realize what the possibilities are. And so it, it it's really concerning. <laughs> It's, it's terrible. Oh, we should have standards. You know, as a designer, it offends me more than anything else visually that I see out there. It's cheap. It's, you know, the, re the retailers have to be responsible too. Go and buy. Go and buy a sign, okay? Stop making the beer companies make you a sign. This is a willful thing here. This is like, okay, I need a sign. I don't want to pay for it. I'm going to go to a distributor, have them build me a sign, and it's okay that they put their logo next to mine. Uh, but after a while, you just have all this ugliness and Guam no longer becomes this kind of well-designed community visually, right? Let's all as a community start figuring out how to clean up the look of our island. Right? They need to do something about their, you know, enforcement of signage. It's just terrible. It's ugly. There's a density actual rule for the number of stores or businesses that can do alcohol within a specific area. You know, I'm all for business, but I'm all for responsible business as well. There are rules and regulations as it relates to signage. And if they're in violation and cannot, cannot be placed within so many feet of a school, or a nursery, or, or, or even a religious facility, then we've got to look into it. You know, we've been asking include the mayors in the business license process and actually people actually go out and take a tape measure measure and if they're within that violation then really don't give them the license tell them I'm sorry choose another location I mean I hate to do that to businesses who've been a part of the community but if we're serious then enforce it if not then get it out of the books because all it does is just make it look like oh wow we're you know on paper we look really good you know we're have you know safe and drug-free school zones but in type of enforcement never happens the Abispos. Oh yeah, literally right outside the gate, you have a mini mart, which I don't know if they count a thousand feet from that as the front gate or this, so, you know, we'll see. But, whoopsie. So how far do you think that would be 
from this ad to that school. See, that's the part. Is, is it the school property? Like I said, density-wise, this is too much. Within literally how many feet from each other? You have one, one, two, three, four <laughs> stores. Literally just yeah, in, 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 in less than a mile, I would say even less than a half a mile of road. So is it too much? But, you know, but I think that's where the regulatory agencies can step up and say, yeah, maybe it's high time we, you know, stop serving this or stop allowing this. But I think that's where we need to get in the, the legislation to kind of check that out. But like I said, Payless doesn't need it to advertise what they got inside. Right. Neither do the gas stations. So then why did the small mini marts do? I started jumping balconies, I broke into one of the rooms. I took like five grand, went on and we started buying liquor again. I was having fun, drinking, fighting all the way down to the hallway. And I, put him, I, I pushed him inside the window. He fell off and I got stuck in the window. After I woke up, I was in the hospital. That's when he just popped in with the gun, boom. Just slammed the sliding door on him, boom. I didn't know what to do at first. So I just looked at the laptop, everything. Saw a phone inside the drawer. Saw a camera, I took it. Saw a bag of clothes. There was a lot of alcohol. Me and a couple of friends went out and we stole, robbed the store. And I can't recall the others, but for this time, this is the last time I got arrested for kidnapping. The thing that bothers me most is the law is there. It's not enforced. It's too many, too many, too many violations. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Right. There's a couple of officers out there oh, that yeah? are waiting to, waiting to see officers? you. officers? Yeah. No problem. Your peeps, your peeps. <laughs> thank you so much. We're just going to mic you up real quick. Okay. And then we'll get to the questions. Thank you. Um, everything is defined by the Guam laws, right? <clears throat> so how much um, of a, a side of a building or the facade of a building can be covered by signs is a uh, is a highly regulated and legal process that goes to the Guam legislature, becomes Guam law, is regulated by Department of Public Works. Any one senator could look at it, but if we're looking at oversight jurisdictions, uh, it would be that, that senator who has oversight of Department of Public Works first, so that you don't overstep that oversight chair's uh, ability to move forward on, on the agency that he, has over, he or she has oversight of. 
And if they don't want to facilitate it moving forward, then you can ask any one of the other senators, any other 14. In, in our case, who's, who's the... Uh... Oversight Chair of Department of Public Works, it's uh, Senator Tom Adda. does allow for a um, store owner, for example, to put up advertisements, you know, showing uh, a certain brand of beer, uh, how much it costs, uh, presenting the facts related to that product. As long as the advertisement uh, does not have a content that um, entices the customer to consume the product, then that's when it's against the law. These are old archaic signage laws that are in place and if the legislature is watching this movie, please rewrite it. The person that rewrites the signage laws on Guam will be elected governor, I promise you, because it needs to change. I mean, it's, it's terrible. So the average citizen has uh, many options to effectuate change through public policy. You can change public policy by petitioning the legislature to go to a senator you're uh, probably comfortable with talking with about an issue of importance. And uh, typically what would happen is you have the concept, you write it down, there's a proposed piece of legislation, then you send it into the respective committees, and then the committee will conduct its own hearing. And that, that's, the, that's the whole bureaucratic process with passing bills. Personally, for me, I, I, when, when, you, when you think about introducing legislation, it's not just the, what is it that you don't want them to do? Then you gotta start thinking about, by imposing certain prohibitions, then you gotta be careful about what other rights might you be um, might you be impinging on uh, you know freedom the freedom of expression sometimes um, in, living in a democracy as we do um, the freedom of speech and to be able to try to capitalize on our capitalistic um, uh, society that we live in the ability to sell wares and products and services is also a function of advertisement I know that's part of the the First Amendment or freedom of speech or where we're allowed to expose, you know, what we have to the community, that's America, that's democracy. But how can we control it where we're not exposing a lot of the things that's causing a negative effect across the board? Where they should be either reduced to certain areas, whether it's just in an ice box or where adults are allowed. That's one of the, the challenges that we all face, same as tobacco. There's a lot of criticism of my being a nanny, you know, I introduced nanny legislation. But I think it's imperative that as a policy maker that we do things to make sure that our community is safer and is healthier. If we realize that something is, is a danger to our children, then we should speak up and do something to control it. The community just needs to come together and just decide, you know, we just have to make that hard decision are we going to risk losing money or are we going to keep risking losing lives?
When I go to your house, oh man, you live in a two-story house, you, you, 50 inch TVs in all the rooms, man, you, you know, you live large, man, and you know, you have a, and mind you, you have both parents. Both parents have good jobs, both, you, both parents work, they take you to school, they, they take you to buy whatever you want at the mall, stuff like that, for your school clothes, stuff like that. So you have this great light, but somehow you got caught with, let's say, alcohol or marijuana and put you in our program. So you see the family background behind you. Then I see you again, you guys, jeans, you guys, you know, both going to treatment class. Then I go to your house, and your house is a tin shack. You live with your dad because the mom is separated. In your tin, literally tin shack, your floor is dirt. It's a dirt floor, it's a tin shack, and it's about maybe a 20 by 20 room, which has the kitchen, your sleeping area, and your restroom all together. And the jungle is just growing around your house because you don't cut the grass or anything like that. But yet, when you come into a room like this and we're all together, people don't see the challenges that you have. But yet, you, you, you got in trouble and it brought you in a program. People don't see the challenges that you have. But at the end result, both of you are in the same program with the same issues, but different challenges at home. So the question, you know, why? You know, why do you have the same problem that he has when he has overwhelming challenges at home and you have everything? Ever since middle school year. Like what, what grade? Like eighth grade, I started drinking, but sixth grade, I started smoking marijuana. Well, I started drinking because my friends are all like 23, 24. They're older than me and they all drink, so I started drinking. My uncle, he was a drunk. He used to abuse me, harass me every time he's drunk. Yes, the place I, I lived at was, there was a lot of alcohol every day. People was drinking and stuff. At night, you know, the place I lived in where is where alcohol was always around, so. Since my dad passed away, I, there was a lot of pain I was going through. So I found that drinking was, you know, when I drink, I don't, I don't feel that, that much pain, you know? I don't have to think about my father and stuff like that. So I started drinking just to make the pain go away, so yeah. 
you know, it takes me away from all the pain that I'm holding in. Like, you know, I lost my dad. I grew up without a father, you know, it's only just my mom that wanna raise me and you know it's pretty hard growing up, you know, not having a father to teach you what's right and wrong. You know, so basically I had to go out and I had to, you know, I, I had no fa father figure to teach me what was right or wrong, so you know, I just started being me. I didn't really care anymore. So, you know, I hated the road. And uh, just every time I dream, man, it's, it's not, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not saying that when I drink, I cause trouble or anything, but, you know, it just takes me away from all the, all the pain that I've been holding in. Yeah, that's pretty much what I wanna say, but, you know, like I said, drinking's not, drinking's not the way to go. I'll give you my burdens, I'll give you peace. All my desire, I'll give you what you need. And what about this change, Lord? And I'll set you free. But this so heavy, I'm leading at my feet. Lead him at your feet. So, where do I go from me, Lord? Just follow me, just follow me. I follow you wherever you lead, wherever you lead, wherever you lead. That's it. He meant to that song. This is, um, this is a very perplexing issue. I think there's a lot of conversation that needs to take place across the community. We shouldn't have the highest rates of alcohol consumption come from our islands. That is discouraging. If no one speaks up, then who's gonna do it, you know? And I think this is power. What you guys are doing is power. I can be supportive of any effort to try to protect our kids. All they need to do is get that sense that somebody still cares, somebody's listening, and all they need to do is be show that path right to the right direction. I see I come a long way with you.